Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you for joining our Bible study today. And I hope you are having a great moment. Look, there's a great song that reminds us to give God thanks and to give him praise. And if you haven't done so today, we owe God all the praise. Amen. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, he is good. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for he is good. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, he is good. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. He is good. How many of you know he's worthy? Be worthy. He is good. He is good. For he is worthy. Worthy. He is good. He is good. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. For he is good. He is good. Amen. Amen. May we pray. <clears throat> Eternal Father, we thank you for a beautiful day where we can give you praise and where you, we can give you glory. Now, we all have circumstances and trials that are in our lives, but yet we refuse to allow things to dampen our spirit. We refuse to allow individuals to dampen our spirits. We refuse, Lord, our own attitudes and things that get into way that cause us to make us feel down, depressed, and even out. Lord God, we lift our faith right now. We're praying for your Holy Spirit to be in our midst. And we also are praying, Lord, that your Spirit will continue to teach us. For us the Holy Ghost that is the true teacher of us all. Lord God, we give you praise and we give you glory. And I pray, O oh Lord, that you will use me, use us. In this time of sharing, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's give God some praise this afternoon, this evening, whichever way you're catching this time of study. <clears throat> we introduced about five to six weeks ago a study entitled A Survey in the Old and New Testament about being blessed and giving back. Again, being blessed and giving back. And we will start with the review of the past six weeks. And we won't take long, but it'll be a review to freshen our memories and to share with others that may have missed along the way. On next week, we will start with the New Testament, looking at various scriptures that help us to see how we are blessed, how we give, and how we honor God in the process. But before we do, I hope you can see right here, I have a... Uh, vote, uh, I voted sticker. My wife and I were blessed to go voting today, and we are encouraging others each day with early voting. We're here in Texas, but wherever you are, to go and vote. Um, it took us about an hour. Some of the members have shared with me it's taking them two hours to four hours. Uh, make sure you eat. I ate a good lunch. In fact, cooked some greens and some sautéed uh, um zucchini with uh, squash and onions and bell pepper and that was my lunch and we were ready there my wife had water and everything be prepared when you go and vote uh, the other thing is i want to express my appreciation to all our members and uh, those who have visited us on virtual ministries and online giving we thank you for your tithes and other offerings and i hope and pray that you will continue but we also want to not only give for the sake of giving, we want you to have a biblical, theological, and spiritual understanding for why we give. Now for today, we will review the following scriptures in the Old Testament that we looked at in terms of giving. I challenge and encourage you to be prepared to take notes or keep a journal, whether it be in your smartphone or online, on the computer, however you do it, cloud, you name it. The first scripture we look at will be Genesis chapter 14, verses 
17 through 20. When we looked at that particular verse of scripture, we looked at how tithing became a part of our religious process. Sometimes we don't like that word religious, but I need to use it here. How tithing became a part of our religious, and if we can say our spiritual and personal process for giving to the Lord. The second item is Genesis chapter 28, verses 16 through 19. This is where we see the tithe connected to the house of worship. Again, the first passage will look at how the tithe is connected to God. The second passage, Genesis chapter 28, verse 16, and of course we look at a few verses, deal with how tithing is connected to the house of God. And then thirdly, we know that even with solid teaching, that if there is no willingness on a person's behalf to give, then that person will not give. So we spoke a little bit looking at uh, Gen Exodus, I'm sorry, Exodus 25 and Exodus 35, Exodus 25 and Exodus 35, looking at examples of willingness. And then fourthly, when we give our tithe and our offerings, if we may include at this point, there is a reason why we give it. We don't just give to the church without knowing what the money is being used for. And we talked about churches having budgets, and we'll come back to that in a moment. So look at Deuteronomy chapter 26, verses 12 and 13 for that. And then we also looked at First Chronicles chapter 29, verse 14, where we acknowledge everything we have comes from God. And we do what we can to give back to God, but also our giving is a way of honoring and giving God praise. And then we'll take time to look at Malachi chapter 3, uh, verses 8 through 10, many of us that have been giving our tithes and offerings are familiar with these passages. But there may be some person that may not know it, and you're hearing it for the first time. That's Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 to 10. If you will, let's go to Genesis chapter 14, and we will look at verse 17. Genesis chapter 14, beginning at verse 17. And I'm reading from the New International Version, the NIV. After Abram returned from defeating Kedilamir and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Sheva, that is, the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. And let me pause here. Some words and symbols that we read throughout the scripture ought to cause a light to come on or a thought to connect to other things that we have been taught in Christ. So even though we're reading in Genesis and we hear about what bread and wine, it should connect us to what? Holy communion, the eating, the breaking of the bread and the drinking of the wine. So even though we're looking at Genesis long before communion was established, here is a spiritual, a biblical spiritual connection that begins to draw us to different parts of the scripture. And I like to refer to this as biblical framework. We always are developing what our biblical framework. Verse 18 again, then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God, most high. And he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God most high, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. So this is where we learned and taught where Abram, in light of the fact that God blessed him to overcome kings and kingdoms, in return, Abram felt a need to do something. And what Abram decided, Abraham as we know him, he decided to give a tenth of everything that he was blessed with and to give it to God 
in this case, Melchizedek, known as the high priest. When we read in Hebrews, we will learn that this high priest would be equated to Christ or the Messiah. So in a sense, when we give our tithe, we give it to God, we give it to the Messiah, we give it to Christ. And that's the biblical foundation that we can give in, in that reference point. So Abraham becomes the, the, the primary leader who teaches us, who demonstrates to us that when God has blessed us to overcome various uh, major uh, items in our life, and they don't have to be major, but, but the fact that God has blessed us and brought us through, a way that we can respond is through tithing. Now may we turn our attention to Genesis chapter 28. Remember, we're doing a review of the Old Testament selected scriptures that we were looking at. And we'll look at the New Testament because there are some that believe that giving is only Old Testament or the tithe is only Old Testament. And that is not true. Let's look at Genesis chapter 28. And then we shall begin our reading at verse 20. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone that I have set up a pillar would be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. Now, Abraham connects tithing with God. His grandson, remember Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob. Jacob connects tithing, yes, to God, but to God's house. We won't go through the litany of uh, Jacob's life and also the relationship he had with his twin brother Esau. But what we will say is this, as he was running for his life and God spared him and blessed him and protected him, Jacob had already made a vow to God that if God did certain things in his life, that in return, he would do something. And Jacob makes it a vow, which means that we cannot unvow it. Jacob, as a man of faith, and then one of the pillars and foundations of our faith, is one who, and, and no, we, we're not talking about the Christian context. We're talking about the, the religious ethos. We're talking about the context of the Judeo-Christian understanding of believing in, in God. So when we think about Jacob making a vow to God, making a commitment, and God did come through on his commitment, he says, God, you do this for me, and I'll do this for you. That's where it becomes sacred. All vows are sacred. And may we throw in marriage vows or contracts and agreements. You may feel as if you did it with the person. But always be mindful that any time a believer makes a commitment with anyone, not only God, but with anyone, that is a sacred vow. And not only that, God is looking for us to follow it through. So our example in our vows and the sacred vows that we take in terms of our relationship with God, if we do like Jacob, God, if you bring me through, if you take me out, Make sure that I have a roof over my head, food to eat, and clothing on my back. This is what I'll do. I will give a tenth of what I have been blessed with, and I will give it to your house, to God's house. Let's look at the third item, willingness. I know that as we talk about giving, and no, I'm not a prosperity theologian or a prosperity gospel person, I'm an individual who believes in healthy stewardship, one that when God blesses us, that we have responsibility to give back. We have a responsibility to support the house of God, but then we also know stewardship is not limited to finances, although that is our focus at this moment. If you look at Exodus chapter 25 and turn to, let's say, verses 1 and 2, Exodus 25, it says, the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites to bring me an offering. 
you are to receive the offering for me from each man, each person whose heart prompts him or her to give. Listen to this, verse 2 again. Tell the Israelites to bring me an offering. God is speaking to Moses. You are to receive this offering from each person whose heart prompts the individual to give it. Now, in some instances, everyone is not prompt to give or to give tithes and offering. And what we want to share with you is that when you do sense that prompting or that pricking or that nudging, then I like to think that it's God's way of tapping into our consciousness. In other words, even when you hear a person teaching or preaching or witnessing about giving, it may not mean necessarily anything to you. But then once it starts tapping into your soul, this is when it becomes personal. This has nothing to do now with the preacher, the church, or what other folk are saying. It has to do now with your personal relationship and the Lord. I can remember when uh, I was given to the church and then one day I was sitting in church. You know what? Instead of me just giving here and yonder and there, I said every week I'm going to start giving. I think I said $5. Now, I wasn't tithing or giving an offer. It's just that I had that prompting in me. And was feeling so good about what God was doing in my life. I believe I was about 20, maybe, yeah, about 20, 21 years old. I was making a personal commitment because of God that I would start blessing God and blessing the church. Now, little did I know at the time that I was way below what I should have been doing. But then I learned after reading the word and hearing more people teach and preach about tithes and offerings. And then I began to read it and study for myself. I developed a personal conviction, meaning that there was no way that any person could talk me out of doing what the Lord had led me to do spiritually and then develop my own relationship with God and commitment and conviction. And now I share that with others. I'm not trying to force anyone to do anything, but I do think it's my responsibility as a child of God to teach and preach in hopes, yes, that what God revealed to me, that he'll reveal to you, and that the conviction that I love and I have now, that somehow, yeah, I hope I can influence you some and it rub off on you. I know all the, the comments that we make before giving tithes and offering, even at a young age, you know, the church don't need it or what they're doing with the money. I get it. I understand all that. I raised those questions and those thoughts early on myself. But on the other hand, as I matured in Christ, I found out that when I, when I understand my relationship with God, God helps to answer all those other things. But guess what? That don't even matter now. All those uh, naysaying comments and small things, you know, work through it if you got to work through it. But I have a, willis, a willingness to honor God with what God has blessed me with. And that's how I've lived now for years, over two decades, what, 20 about 24, 25 years plus. And I believe in tithes and offerings. And if you have followed along with this, you'll see the teachings that we have learned and have practiced even in our own lives. But look at Exodus chapter 35, and we'll look at verses 4 and 5. Moses said to the whole Israelite community, this is what the Lord has commanded. From what you have taken offering for the Lord, now, we bring it to the church. And of course, right now, everybody's doing virtual giving and online. The mediums may be different. That's fine. But the objective is still the same. We give to God, which is given to the church. Or as we give to the church, we're given to God. They are synonymous. They are mutual. They're not apart from each other. And that's what we hear in Exodus 35 verse 4. Moses speaking to the Israelite community and the scripture said, the whole verse five, from what you have take, what, from what you have taken offering for the Lord, everyone who is willing is to bring to the Lord an offering of gold, silver, and bronze. And we can go on and on and on and on about the amounts or the types of things that they brought. The key here is that people had what? A willingness, a willingness. 
And while we're focusing on finance, stewardship, and things of that nature, that's true with anything we do in the church, for that matter, for life. If a person does not have a willingness, meaning the free understanding of positioning one's mind, spirit, soul, and body to go and do it, no strings attached, that's what the willingness means. Uh, when I when I give my tithes and offerings, even though I'm pastoring, I'm not looking over my shoulders, uh, trying to see every nickel and dime uh, that the stewards, and we use stewards in our church in terms of the movement. Now, that does not mean now we're not receiving reports and practicing accountability. What I'm letting you know is I'm not worried about the leaders and what we do regarding how we should take care of the money of the church. We have responsible leaders. We have great leaders. For that matter, if I give to any particular ministry or organization, I'm not looking over my shoulder wondering and worrying what it is they have done. If I had that much problem with it, then I shouldn't have gave it in the first place. The idea of giving willingness is to trust God and to trust the individuals in whom we're giving to. But the other part of that equation is that the persons that are accountable and responsible and who will receive the income of tithes and offerings must also be individuals that are accountable to who? To God. And yes, we are accountable to one another. So when I talk about willingness, I'm talking about a freed up soul that not only would do it, but that is glad and excited about giving and supporting the work of ministry. May we now go to Deuteronomy as we talk about accountability and purpose. Deuteronomy chapter 26, and we shall look at verses 12 and 13. Deuteronomy chapter 26, verses 12 and 13. Now, every individual should operate with a budget. I'm talking about your household, your own person, whether you are single or whether it's a husband and wife or a family is living together, whatever your arrangements may be, every individual family needs to have a budget. But then secondly, every congregation, pastors, leaders, members needs to have a budget. Now, some of you may be tricked into believing that because we are in a time of COVID and we have all kinds of trials and tribulations, unexpected issues that are taking place, you know, well, we'll wait till it's over or we don't need a budget. Wrong answer. Have a budget. It does not matter how much money comes in or goes out. Everyone needs a budget. If your income is 1000 a month, be it personal or even a church or a ministry or a group, you need to have a budget. The best way to plan a budget is annually and then uh, make sure that you are accountable to it monthly and weekly. Extremely important. And then, of course, you have your own little day checks in terms of how you do. Let's, let's move forward because I want to make sure we get this in in a reasonable time. I know many of us are looking for Bible studies not to be an hour, hour and a half, and two hours, which this will not be. Uh, give us a few more minutes and then we will wrap uh, I'll set it up, but we will have the content in place. When you look at Deuteronomy chapter 26, verses 12 and 13, uh, let's, well, 13, let's just look at verse 13. Then say to the Lord, your God, I have removed from my house the sacred portion and have given it to the Levite, the alien, the fatherless, and the widow, according to all you commanded. I have not turned aside from your commands, nor have I forgotten any of them. There are four, if we can say, foundations that a budget, a church must and should operate from, starting with this particular scripture. And, and here in verse 13, we heard about Levites, aliens, and, and, and some translations will say foreigners or strangers then the fatherless or orphans, and then widows. And we want to, if we can, describe this in three ways in terms of budget expenses. Number one, the Levite is the person who provides leadership 
to the overall house, house of worship. But then we can expand that to say Levites or priest or pastor and staff. That's administrative. And for those that have a problem with that, hey, take, take it up with the word. I'm just teaching what the word is teaching us. So there's an obligation for uh, taking care of those who take care of that Lord's business. Number two, the alien, which is the stranger or the foreigner. This is a person or persons who are not part of the in crowd. Now, I'm not using in crowd as a negative here. Not part of the congregation. This is where we get outreach from, outreach ministry, meaning persons who may not be a part of the routine or the ongoing operations. These are tithes, monies, uh, items that have been itemized to do ministry were outside of the congregation. And then the third item, which has to do with the fatherless and widows or orphans and widows. The orphans and widows would be part of the group, part of the congregation. So that's in reach, in house. We have outreach and then we have what? In reach. So the budget or the tithe would be used for three basic components. The administration, outreach, and then in reach. And then that can be itemized in countless of ways, which is a whole nother segment in itself. But what we want to make clear is this, that when we give our tithes and offerings to the church, these are the three basic, I'm talking about at bare premise, bare foundation, in terms of how we give our tithes and other offerings. That's Deuteronomy 26, verse 13. Look at 1 Chronicles 29, 14. This is where we learn that everything we have comes from God. And when we give, we give out a spirit of praise to God. It says, 1 Chronicles 29, but who am I and who are my people? That we should be able to give as generously as this. Everything comes from you. And we have given you only what comes from your hand. There's another scripture. I don't remember the chapter and verse at the moment, but it goes this way. What is it that you have that you did not receive? The psalmist is right, reminds us in the 24th book of Psalm, verse 1, that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and they that dwell what therein. So everything we have comes from the earth, comes from God's hand. We create from what God has already created. We have from what God already what had. So when we give our tithes, as we listen to David, stand before the congregation, encouraging them to give, being an example of giving himself to support his son Solomon and the leaders and the members of that day who were building the temple, one of the greatest temples to, known, to be known throughout history. They were given to support what the work of the church through their tithes, through their offerings. Now, let's look at tithing. We'll start with uh, Malachi chapter 3. We had stated earlier that those of us who have been tithing and giving our offerings for years, we're familiar with this passage, and it might be someone who is listening and need to hear it for a second or another time, or you may be hearing it for the first time. Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 reads as follows. Will a man, will a person rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? And the scripture said, in tithe and offerings. Verse 9, you are under a curse. The whole nation of you because you are robbing me. No matter what your argument is, when we don't give our tithes and offerings, again, that goes back to a person's relationship in God. Verse 10, the word said, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. We're talking about the house of God. Test me a church for our purposes right now. Test me in this, said the Lord Almighty. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and, and pour out so much blessing 
that you will not have room enough to receive it. Now, allow me to conclude with these thoughts. When you give your tithes and offerings to the church, when you give money to the church, we're not giving so we can get money back. And that's a part that prosperity theology teaches that I don't teach and we should not teach because it's biblically incorrect. When we give our tithes and other offerings uh, to the Lord, which is a gift to the church, God has outlined in the scripture three ways that we benefit from tithes and offerings. Now, if you get that envelope in the mail and get a check in the mail or you won a lotto or you went somewhere gambling and then you increase your earnings, that, that's, that's not what we're talking about. Is it true or not? I would say no. But here again, I'm not the judge of that. Let that be between you and your relationship and the Lord. What I do know is this, is that when you give your tithes and offerings, according to the scripture, there are three fundamental things that the word tells us that God blesses or benefits when it talks about he will open up the floodgates of heaven. Look at verse 11. He says, I will, number one, prevent pests from devouring your crops. Number two, and the vines in your field will not cast their fruit. And then verse 12, number three, it says, then all the nations will call you blessed. So what I'm hearing is when tithes and offerings are going forth, and I'm a personal witness of this as well, number one, God makes sure that the work you do, your crops, that's what that is, your labors, your career, your job, your efforts, that it won't be wasted and destroyed. Number two, the vines in your field has to do with all springs or produce. And even though we're talking about vegetation, we're talking about uh, generations that are coming after us, our children, our grandchildren. So when we tithe and, and give of our offerings, we're not only thinking about ourselves, but we're thinking of what? Present and future generations. And lastly, he says, the word says rather, that you will be called blessed. And when I think about that, I think about a person's name or my name or your name. Now, it does not mean that people won't try to destroy you or put you down, or drag your name in the dirt. That comes with just being alive. There are times when people will say and do things, whether it be family, friends, or even strangers for that matter, and will say uh, things to put you down, or to speak bad of your name. But what I believe, that because of my relationship in the Lord, folk can do what they want to do. All I know is, as we shared early, Psalms 23, verse 6, surely goodness and mercy shall what follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So when my relationship is where it needs to be with God and is where it needs to be with other people, and both are a constant work, then I'm not worried or wondering about what folk are saying or doing. What I realize is that God will God will take care of that. And then when I need to deal with it, I seek God to lead and guide me when it comes to other folk and what they're doing or not doing. But I'm not going to weigh my life down and my faith down based upon gossip and naysaying and what people are putting out, whether it be right or wrong. But when you give your tithe and your offerings, you find out that God will what? God will take care of that. Well, look, let me stop here. And we will start next week with the New Testament. I hope that in some way, this review over tithe, tithes and offerings, what it means to be blessed and given back, will help you in your biblical and personal understanding regarding why we give tithes and offerings. And I hope that you're supporting your ministry, your church. And if you're a member of Carter, we look for your continued support of our tithes and offerings to the church. We're doing great ministries right now. We thank God for that. Uh, at the moment, we're encouraging individuals to uh, pay your conference claims. And that's above your tithes. And then see what you can do to increase your benevolence over the next couple of weeks as we look at sending funds to support individuals that are in the areas of Louisiana. 
right now, people who have suffered from the storm over the past uh, week to four, five, six weeks and still have not recovered. Again, we're looking for those that belong to uh, Carter CME. If you could increase your offering toward the benevolent as we look at sending funds to support and be of encouragement to our families that are in the Louisiana area. Well, look, don't forget to vote. Thank you for joining us for Bible study. Uh, you can always go to www.cartermetroftw.com for our Bible studies on Wednesdays and then also for Sunday school at 9.30 on Sundays and then also 10.45 worship uh, on Sundays. Thank you for joining us and may we pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for how you keep on blessing us and we don't even deserve it. Your grace and your mercy and your love is evidence, proof every day of your presence and your power in us and with us. Lord God, I pray right now for that person who uh, does not give tithes and offerings that they would give. For those that have done so and now are not doing it, I pray that you will move upon their spirits, that they will see the need to continue to support the work of the church. Lord God, we love you, we honor you, and we give you praise, and we give you glory. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Thank you for joining us. Oh, next week will be uh, Mark chapter 12 for the New Testament. Next week, the Gospel of Mark chapter 12. Take care.